So what was IIM Ahmedabad in the year 2000? What were those two years for you were like? In my IIM, we had the Godhra riots and the earthquake. Both were there in my year. So the entire city of Ahmedabad was burning when we had our day zero of placement. So I would want to perhaps understand the value and the point where you decided that you need an MBA. There was no thought process. Okay, go to Kodar College, go to IIM Ahmedabad, join McKinsey. I do think MBA gives you two maybe three specific things. I very interestingly have been uh, following uh, Vinod Khosla. He had this controversial tweet that uh, went viral that I can't imagine having one life to live and uh, spending it working at McKinsey. I think it's very interesting that you always take a pot shot at the best institution. The IIMs, they, they say they are not a business school, they are a management institution. Do you want to yes. double click on that? I'm curious. Welcome to yet another episode of the CEO Diary on Satakshi Show. In this Shatakshi show, I am going to be talking to Toshan. Toshan has been a former senior partner at McKinsey & Company and the global CEO of UPL. In this Shatakshi show, you will get his rich perspectives and his views on everything such as MBA, Indian education system, about his rich experiences at IIM Ahmedabad, about McKinsey and about many interesting contemporary things such as the weakness of Indian passport, about our current taxation structure which is many a times questioned by a lot of people and of course about work-life balance that he calls mostly as life balance. If you like this podcast, feel free to hit on the like button and of course share it with your friends so that we get motivated to bring many more phenomenal leaders and CXO levels such as Toshin himself and I really hope that you enjoy this one. So welcome Toshin to the CEO Diary on the Shatakshi show. It's an immense honor and a privilege for me to have you on this show and hear about your journey, your perspectives and your views on a lot that is going around in India and of course the world. The world may know you as a former senior McKinsey partner and of course a COO at UPL as well. But right off the bat would absolutely love for you to share your introduction with the world in your own words and then we can get started. I think it's always difficult to introduce yourself, but um, I think from a professional standpoint, Shadakshi, you got it right. I used to be uh, um, a management consultant for more than 19 years before um, I decided to do something else and uh, joined the corporate world. And now I'm the global COO for one of the largest uh, chemicals and food players. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think uh, very happy to be on the show and uh, talk about stuff which can help uh, younger professionals as they are at the start of their career and whatever I can do to share views, thoughts, uh, very happy to uh, do that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Toshin, once again. And uh, yes, we are doing this to make sure that many young professionals who look up to you, who admire you and would want uh, perhaps a piece or a leaf from your book could be should be able to learn. So I would want to start from the start and by start I mean that I would want to understand your childhood journey. Uh, where were you born? What was childhood for you was like? Uh, what were your parents doing? What were certain dinner table debates for you that shaped you in the current uh, manner that you are? So I was born in Thane, which is a suburb uh, outside Mumbai. The, it's currently very well known because the current Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Iknath Shinde, uh, that was where Agnash Shinde was born, that was his constituency and uh, his son Shrikan Shinde also is currently there. So that's the uh, thing, it's very near uh, Mumbai, but yet Thane retains its own identity. Uh, so I was born in Thane. Uh, dinner table conversations, see I think it was a very different time, okay, because there was no, it, it's difficult for the current generation to imagine there were no laptops, there were no mobile phones, there was no internet. Um, so it's a very, very, there's no Netflix, anything that you say, no Facebook, and there used to be the world would still go on, uh, even in the absence of many of these things. So I think uh, from my, uh, you know, so I, I was, there was, there's no, uh, you know, difficult childhood story or anything. I think I was quite um, privileged. My father was a businessman. Uh, he used to have his own small business in uh, the field of medical equipments. My mother is a doctor. Uh, both of them are still, Hail and hearty touch wood. They do their own stuff even today. So I think it's very, very, I would say, a comfortable uh, childhood uh, in that sense. I think the crux really was 
uh, obviously academics was quite uh, important and excelling in academics uh, but i used to do a lot more of um, you know extracurriculars whether it was uh, quizzes or i used to be a national level table tennis player also so the dinner conversation there was a lot about achievement orientation uh, there was a lot about uh, you know uh, coming from a uh, well to do but middle class um, upper middle class background it was always about the future and how do you make sure you are securing your future because there was a whole thing about safety and making sure that you go to the best academic institutions you try and do the best uh, in whatever uh, you put so i think the theme uh, about you know as you put it dinner table conversations was a lot about uh, um, you know do your best and leave the rest so because outcome was never in in one's hands and uh, i remember still a line that my father used to always say is first deserve then desire so he used to always say you if i would ask him it was never about the money because that uh, you know he was a very successful businessman so he, he the money was not a problem but he would say do you really want this uh, and do you think uh, why should you get it so that was you know for a long time and then obviously uh, you know my schooling was in in thane Uh, my college where i did my bcom from uh, podar college in matunga and uh, from there i went to i am ahmedabad and and so on so was yeah no, there, there's, a... no there's no i said it was a reasonably simple uh, i don't, don't try and complicate life uh, uh, i think i think there was an em- emphasis on academics there was an emphasis on doing your best uh, and uh, you know i think there was always this trade off between enjoying the current moment versus planning for the future so that dilemma which is always there because you do see that some people the earlier generations uh, in india always had this thing of uh, kal kya hoga and you are always trying to you know be conscious of the future there is a generation which is live for today and uh, i think my generation was this transition between living for the moment which is now because you know everything is instantaneous right you want to watch something is instantaneous you want to order something is instantaneous you want to read something is instantaneous for us things happened on a weekly basis so some of the best serials and series would have it's a weekly thing going out to hotels was a weekly or a monthly thing so the whole thing of instant gratification was not there you had to wait you had to have patience to actually get something more meaningful whereas the earlier generation i just felt that saved up too much whether it was saving of money saving of energies emotions for a better tomorrow there was no living for today and uh, making the best out of it so so yeah so i am one important reflection of my thing is i am this is transitional generation between the here and now and life always happens at the end of a journey and you miss out on uh, life itself well, that's a very beautiful introduction and thank you so much for sharing that Uh, while he was speaking i was thinking of my father who always saved so that his three kids could go to good schools good colleges and now he is retired and i actually wonder did he actually almost give it up all for uh, us and here are we who are if not trying to live for the moment but appreciate that there is limited benefit of traveling let's say in your 70s or 80s when your body may not support you Uh, with that i would want to perhaps understand uh, the value and the point where you decided that you need an mba especially in today's uh, generation is questioning that a lot with the of course i really get mba being out there a lot of questions are of course coming for iims as well your parents are doctors so what kind of ecosystem were you in that made you think that yes this is the right time for me to do an mba and i would want to apply to iim ahmedabad it was not a i don't think it was so i was in a very simple was a very so i read a, a business today magazine where it showed the list of uh, you know there were some young people who uh, were getting paid the highest salaries okay and there was this one person there who my uncle knew and i said look this I, this was when i was my 10th standard so i said look i want uh, you know this this seems interesting and by the way that time that salary was i would say 40000 rupees a month so it would be like 6 lakh or 4 lakh 85 lakh rupees and i'm just like 94 kind of thing so uh, i said i want to be like this person so i said okay let me take you to his house so my father and my uncle took me to that guy's house who used to stay in washi and uh, as a part of it i asked him saying you know you've come in the magazine uh, you know and he was like very dashing pose with tie and all it is the campus placement photos 
So I said, I want to be like you. So what, what did you do? So he said, oh, it's very simple. I went to Podar College. Then I went to I'm Ahmedabad. And then I joined McKinsey. So I said, okay, life is simple. So I, that's why. So there was no thought process. Okay, go to Podar College. Go to I'm Ahmedabad. Join McKinsey. So it was to me as straightforward. And I actually believe in if somebody has done all the hard work of researching things and all, then if you trust the person, just do what that person has said. So for me at that time, uh, a combination of money and fame was important. Okay. And uh, here was a person who showed me the straightforward path to getting there. Now, of course, situations change and also the other part of a question is MBA. Is it important? Is it not? See, I think it depends on what your objective is. I do think MBA gives you two, maybe three specific things. First is definitely it gives a theoretical foundation of managing business. So you at least know what finance is, what marketing is, what people org is, what operations is, what international business is, what economics is. So there's a theoretical foundation irrespective of background, which is why MBA schools or business schools take people from arts, commerce, science, doctors, uh, lawyers, everything. So at, irrespective of background, you have a theoretical foundation for business. I think that's a very important aspect. Second is I do think business schools give you a network, okay, whether it is network of peers or network of alums. And even today, some of the best business schools in the world, I think it is the alumni network, which helps and the connectivity the, the, the way you connect is, oh, you are which batch? Oh, you are X, Y. And it could be the same I am. Then you expand that to a group of I am's. You keep expanding that same networks. Uh, and it's a very powerful thing, whether it's Harvard, whether it is Stanford um, and so on. I think the being a part of the same institute makes you feel connected. And uh, that I think is a very valuable thing. Okay, so that's the second thing you get. I think the third thing which some business schools do give you is real life exposure to business. So whether it is up through case studies or through your internship programs and so on. So you have a low risk way of testing whether you love what you like versus what you don't. So that, you know, later on in your life, you can make those choices. So to me, those three things is what an MBA really gives you. I don't think it gives you, uh, you know, and of course there is a brand. If you're in a good business school, there is a brand. So it just helps recruiters saying rather than go to 10,000 people, I go to five institutes who have themselves done the screening. So it's easier. So to that extent, it's a very sophisticated placement agency. Okay. So, uh, yeah, many, uh, I know the IAMs for sure don't like it because they don't say, they, they say they are not a business school. They are a management institution. That's a different debate. Uh, what's the difference between a business school and a management institution? Uh, but I think that's what an MBA does now. Do you want to is, double click on that? I'm curious. You know, I have never understood the difference myself, but business school makes it very targeted towards, you know, I want to make money because, you know, at the end of the day, business is making money. Management institution gives it a slightly more, you know, you could be ma managing government, uh, you could be in a non-profit, you could be doing in, in many other areas and arenas of life where some of the basic management skills, whether it is people management and so on, are actually the same thing. So, um, but at the end of the day, very few people will go. So I'm going there to just experience, um, you know, or learn about management. People are very clear. I'm going there because it guarantees me a better placement. And that's why if you see what are the statistics, which guide a business school, they say, oh, how many students are placed? What is the average salary? How many are placed internationally and so on. So it's become that much more commercial. I, I don't think the IIMs for sure, or even Harvard and uh, Stanford and all in the old days were very different. They were meant to inculcate a certain set of skills and so on. But I think we've moved away from that. Controversial, but yeah, but that's my view. That's a very valuable view. And I'm also thinking out loud, perhaps because the fees is rising every year. And now the student may not be able to justify based on just widening thought horizons next to Charles River in Cambridge. They may have to justify it because of uh, the valid ROI that uh, they need. So with that, uh, I would want to understand about your two years at IIM. I was watching this famous uh, Rocket Boy series. Uh, Vikram Sarabhai was of course involved as well. If I'm not wrong, there is a library dedicated to him. So we are talking about IIM Ahmedabad in 2000. So what was I in Ahmedabad in the year 2000? What were those two years for you were like? I mean, 
even today i think some of the nightmares will be from those days <laughs> but uh, this i think when you enter and i am or i am amdabad the matter i think first you feel extremely proud of yourself you feel like you have achieved the world okay because you don't know any better but you feel just very very happy that you have made it i think the first couple of months is a great level setter you realize that you are not the cat's whiskers everybody there thinks exactly the same and uh, the professors will treat you you know it's it's almost like a grind okay um the grind is of course later on you realize that the grind is meant to make you better okay you are supposed to go through the so it's almost like you know for lack of a uh, you know i don't want to sound arrogant about it but it's like if you have to create diamonds you have to generate that amount of pressure so you are thrust in like 500 pages of reading case studies you are given no time to breathe and suddenly you start getting very bad grades and you the world shatters because still then everybody who enters is like the best of the best of the best so you always relative comparison wise you always feel you are a superstar and there you realize you are nobody okay so i think it's it humbles your ego in the first uh, trimester and so on and you are like galti ho gayi i think there will be many i uh, will say ki shit i was better off elsewhere because see outside everybody is saying what an amazing how intelligent and here no like your grades are bad which is a different uh, aspect but everybody is as smart as you are smarter and you are like oh that guy is so amazing that person is so amazing and your professors are like earlier you are in college your teachers think you are amazing your school teachers have praised you to uh, in a no end and here the profs don't care because for them many of the profs in iim have been there when kv kamath was also there when falguni nair was also in 80s and the same profs are teaching okay so they have seen or oh, vindi banga would be then indira nui would have been they have seen global ceos and they are like you know kya bachche hain you know it's okay keep your attitude and ego at home so you learn uh, to overcome self doubt you learn to become a lot more humble and then you start the journey of rebuilding yourself back focusing on excel, you know, really cracking the subjects and it's also like i am amdabad gives you a good sense of life that there could be surprise quizzes you don't know what's going to happen you can get from anywhere there is a exam uh some exams are like set by sadistic professors who give you open book because the book will whether you have the book you have it doesn't matter you're not going to be able to score almost anything but it's what life is you say oh it's unfair i didn't know there was a meeting yeah life is meant to be unfair so you get a good taste of the unfairness that life is meant to be life is not meant to be fair okay it hardens you to be ready for any eventuality but you also learn to enjoy you are having a party one night giving the toughest exam the next day then i was going for uh, again i should go all over the country by the third semester i had mastered the the system in terms of what you need to do to crack the system because everything is a system you can always crack any system if you understand the the mechanics of a system whether it's a computer system whether it's a business organization or it's a institution doesn't matter so then it's like you have to balance it if you are always worried about you know exams and all you will never enjoy the moment you will never make friendships you will never but if you are also focused too much on the parties and all you never really get the connections that you need you are never able to go to the exchange programs and all and 2000 to 2002 we had no lack uh, you know computers were not there in our room second year we had computers in the room we had to all go to one computer lab it was like a completely different thing we ha- did not have acs in our rooms like when i go to iims today or isb and so on they are like posh hotels okay reasonably good hotels i think in those days it was like sweating so if it was like heat in amdabad is like very hot you have to use what pour water on the floor to uh, cool it down also in my iim we had the godhra riots and the earthquake both were there in my year so when the do- i was on the third floor when the earthquake happened and i had to get under the bed Uh, and then run down and so on we also had the godhra riots where all placements were almost cancelled uh, we didn't have any of the companies come to campus who had not already flown down so the entire city of amdavad was burning when we had our day zero of placement so so yeah so a lot of experiences and memories but uh, as i said i i do owe a lot to uh, the institution for um, opening my eyes for making now nothing's in tomorrow if i have three board meetings it's okay i'm prepared for it i mean i do think 
I am do get that whole thing out of you, and you are able to balance life. You are able to understand that you have to always be prepared and uh, you know enjoy uh, the process. I was imagining a movie when you said Kothra rides are going on, unfortunately. So and of course you are preparing, and then oh, by the way, the sorry, the, you have to no no something. So I had Kothra rides. I had the earthquake in uh, Ahmedabad where uh, lots of things fell down. Yes. and on exchange program i went to michigan and abo and i was in new york when the twin towers also fell down in 2000 so i have done so the the two years i can like world disasters uh, of uh, different orders so i have a unique ability of being at uh, the place of world disasters so i was there when the terrorist attacks happened i was in express stars i was almost going to go walk across to the oberoi uh, into the, the the ground floor restaurant which was taken over but last minute we said kali yahan gaye the uh you know let's go to the tgif which is in that cr2 mall uh so we just instead of going straight from express stars into where the terrorists would have been we went there as we were eating there were like uh, the uh, the sound of uh, bullets and all and we were just lucky that we were whole night we spent up in express stars looking at what's happening on the tv and uh had so uh, i have been like in you know, a heathrow uh, you know uh, disaster so i've been generally sign of world disaster i've been around Uh, and luckily survived so i i owe a lot to my luck to uh, be there but yet this thing so the movie of oh, you know godhra riots and all it just so we were taken for placements through armed convoy vehicles to the taj which is near the airport because the, the companies who had come one day before only investment banks had come they had refused to step gap because they wanted to be close to the airport to take the flights first flights back and nobody wanted to come to the institute campus uh, for it so it was a Uh, you know at 7 am in the morning um, armed uh, escorts uh, you know and one bus of uh, students who had worn uh, suits and ties and uh, uh, going for the most important day of their uh, la- two years because it's placement day and uh, the entire city was burning we were seeing uh, you know fires all around in the city and still trying to say okay how am i going to get placed how do i answer questions like where do i see myself 5 years from now when uh, stuff around you is so fragile wow it almost ties to the macro and the micro really together uh, of course those were really extremely tough times i remember atal bihari vajpayee ji who is the then prime minister was talking about uh, ram rajya in front of uh, narendra modi and then i'm thinking of this boy story who is in ahmedabad and is trying to make a life uh, of himself and all the incidents that you mentioned if i were you they would make me very humble uh, that i survived life and talking of humility when i was at isp i found isp extremely hectic and i remember going through that bcg process and one of the bcg consultant told me if you found isp hard come and join bcg it's going to be harder so what was more humbling for you was it mckinsey or was it i am in the bath humbling i would say definitely uh, i am in the bath Yeah, for sure, because I just think uh, the institute throws tons of stuff at you, and you have lesser options and choices. I think McKinsey or in any BCG McKinsey, you do have choices. You, if you don't like a certain person, you work with somebody else. You don't like a certain client, so I think flexibility is a lot higher. Of course, what happens is you are a professional by then, so you are a so you and as time goes by, you learn. You have enough time to adjust to a system. I am. the system is crammed and isb is even crammed even further so when you don't have time to understand what's happening uh, time to refl- reflect is not there i think that creates the challenge i think mckinsey was you know the initial years of any top tier consulting firm are always very tough because you are extremely insecure uh, you you are supposed to uh, demonstrate results uh, to clients who are your father's age who know the industry uh, you you are supposed to gain their respect you are supposed to gain their trust and you're like oh, what is this so i remember a um, you know thing where i was serving a power company a utilities player and i go to a, the head of r&d of that and i'm trying to interview him i said hi i'm toshan he said he introduces himself and i asked some what i thought was very intelligent looking sounding question and he said bhai beta tumhari umr kya hai So I said, uh, you know, 23 years, 24 years old. 
and he said i have been in this company for 31 years okay so that was a statement and you are like okay now let's pause with the rest of the interview i'm not sure is going to happen after this kind of a but he was very nice he was very nice and um, um the other like, interesting uh, anecdote was so every morning i was working for a bank every morning because you are in a consulting you have a project so you are like all in because three months you have to achieve results you have to have a presentation you have to show impact so i kept going to one you know very senior person and every morning has to be in his office saying let's do a review where have we reached yesterday today i i used to always interrupt him during his breakfast time because that is the only time i would get because after that he would be very busy so i used to you know i thought i was just you know you help making him use his breakfast time more productively okay so that was my thought process saying you know tum breakfast kar rahe ho waise bhi kuch nahi hai to let me use this time to uh, get things so so for me it was a working breakfast so one day he just said you know bhai he said ki before you and before me this bank was there before you and before me mckinsey was also there okay Bef- after you and after me this bank will survive okay and hopefully so will mckinsey so why are you so always like get something done fast and then he, he started asking me saying why are you doing all this and he kept asking me question then then he said look at the end of the day all of the, he made a very you know not a quasi facetious point where he said ye sab hum kyu karte hai ye sab hum pet ke liye karte hai pehle main apna pet bhar leta hu mujhe breakfast khane do shanti se fir baad mein dekhenge ye sab ki tum itna mat karna hum dono yahi pe rahenge hamare companies bhi yahi rahengi ye khane pe focus kar lete hai pehle so it was a very uh, you know you are always eager beaver wet behind the ears trying to achieve but as people over time develop a maturity of say okay just just be there relax we we'll get it done be more thoughtful so that's when i realized that you know in a consulting firm you are operating at a very different time scale than what clients are because you are trying to get it's a treadmill you are trying to run so fast on a treadmill that sometimes people wonder and say kyu itna bhag rahe ho bhai kya hone wala hai ruko thoda see the world around uh, and make it uh, make it worthwhile almost like uh, how we should live life and careers as well and of course maybe there could be a balance between putting that rigor and stepping back very interestingly i one of my strongest learnings and of course i'll not release the name of the client also came from a senior client um and uh, this was a family business and today as a entrepreneur who has never raised funds i believe in the hindsight i learned the most from him how he would always keep on cropping and chopping budgets that no we will not do this in 50 lakhs we'll do this in 10 lakhs so very beautiful stories uh, tushan i would want to in the same breadth of talking about iim amdabad your education get your views on the modern education system we have in some bit covered about management and business education happy to hear your views on school education as well perhaps if we were to go back in the past i remember your tj master class about vietnam war and connecting that with strategy would you have views on what can indian education system learn from ancient india and perhaps from histor- world history as well so shrash i think um, so i think the education system in ancient india if you just reflect on it what did princess learn and of course i don't want to get into the caste uh, politics issue of it because different castes had certain different because you are meant to do a certain thing in life but let's take for the broadest you know saying kings and princess i'm not being elitist about it but i'm just saying just to use that as an example more than anything else i think there was a significant uh, aspect which was utilitarian see you learned strategy but you learned military strategy you learned weapons you learned how to be fit you learned how to do, be a good administrator because that is what you are expected to do in life now if you just take that back and say in uh, i think at the risk of sounding arrogant and uh, whatever So say I think many of the subjects we learn either the subjects are useless or at least the intent uh, and context behind it is useless because memory is a great skill to have but emphasis excessive emphasis on memory and reproducing uh, regurgitating that thought process is actually an irrelevant skill I mean I also question things like handwriting my handwriting is extremely bad uh, and I always joke that uh, you know in, in consulting you had this thing of confidentiality so I used to say confidentiality assured I, i can't read my own stuff so even if anything is lost nobody can read anything that i have i write so it's okay I, i'm assured of confidentiality but i think we don't th- teach things like say 
स्ट्रेस मैनेजमेंट एवरीबडी देखो आई एम स्ट्रेस स्ट्रेस वी नेवर लर्न स्ट्रेस मैनेजमेंट वी नेवर लर्न हाउ टू आस्क द राइट क्वेश्चन इन स्कूल वुड भी ज्यादा सवाल मत पूछो डोंट आस्क क्वेश्चन डू यू नो आई एम गेसिंग people kids should be inquisitive but the teacher will say don't ask questions except what i'm saying as the gospel truth so how do you balance it out you cannot have people who are inquisitive kids who are inquisitive because they will uh, and then you say listen to what i'm saying even as a parent you always feel that you can't try and imbibe the two things see everybody else you ask the question but if i am telling you something listen to me you cannot have that okay things like how do you have good relationships nobody teaches you these things you evolve over time you know you evolve relationships you you want and then you have any now of course schools are introducing things like sex education okay it's a very specific but i'm saying it's a very minor part of relationships it's critical overall but you never learn these things you never learn how to handle conflict you never learn how to handle money okay some of these things come much later and i don't think it is uh, the ancient system was designed to make sure that the what you wanted to do in life you were taught earlier now the only difference there was very early on in your life you it was clear what you would be doing because of the varna system so yeah the king son did not need to learn a lot about the scriptures which the brahmana son would because he was never expected to do that okay so unlike today because we don't have that so we are saying i could be a artist i could be a scientist i could be a businessman i could be uh, anybody else so how can you so early on tell me what skills to learn and what you know so i do think there is a balance between i would say context subjects which you need to so history why do we why should we learn history it is not for the dates it is to understand the world that is we are in today it is to understand the geopolitics it is to under, have pride in your country it is to understand when is otherwise you look at it and say why is somebody so passionate about shivaji when shivaji ruled such a small part of what was grand india Okay, but why are people so passionate? And similarly, you go to the north and say, but Rana Pratap was beaten in the Battle of Hardy Gati. Why? Why? Is, so history is also about understanding how we got here. Okay, whether it is the Chinese history, geography. I mean, in today's day and age, you say, oh, there is an Eskimo. Who is an Eskimo? Like, I have traveled as north as it can get. There are no Eskimos or anything. You know, nobody lives in an igloo unless it's like a luxury hotel which has been put like an igloo. Okay, the indigenous tribes of Africa have shrunk. So, so what's the context of geography? What is the context of different cultures? So, I just feel the subjects may still be the same. You may need to add certain subjects, but I do think the reason and how they are taught, they are should they are taught for marks, which is okay. I think I don't think you need a way to uh, you know make sure have you learned it or not. But I also think people are changing. I think some of the syllabuses are changing. the ib schools by virtue of better funding are able to move those shifts faster the icse schools the state schools will also evolve i don't think it's it's a matter of time okay that these things happen the sports the i think the question again becomes why are we learning sports is it to build physical fitness is it to build teamwork is it to build achievement orientation so so long as the why becomes clear i think the education system per se i don't think for a mass education you can change all of uh, lots of these things uh, and as you know there's a famous thing that the battle of waterloo was won on the play fields of eton because it's a you know because napoleon was not like, the duke of wellington went to eton and so on but what it shows is eton college and the eton schools they taught you about british english pride they taught you about the value of democracy they taught you about what a rich tradition you came it taught you about teamwork it taught about going for excellence Uh, when you are in uh, whether it's on the rugby field or whether it's in the battlefield of war it taught you about state craft and administration so so to that extent if you get that why correct i think the education system is fine i mean you just need to change that the complication is the teachers okay because for students to be good the system is fine but you the, the core is the teachers now who this wakes up and which outstanding individual say i want to be a teacher to me that's the other aspect but is a separate aspect it's a broader topic but from a modern education standpoint i do think we are changing are we changing fast enough maybe maybe not the skills should we emphasize writing should we emphasize uh, rote memory should we emphasize um, just civics in the way civics was taught i don't know i don't think so i love that point about pride 
and uh, in fact very recently i was uh, reading india after gandhi and then i was actually on the process of also figuring out why gandhi actually left non cooperation movement at the prime of it and then i stepped back and i thought gandhi actually took ethics and values very seriously he knew that if there is violence happening at the prime of non violent movement he doesn't want it to continue and then i was thinking what if i would have learned all of that with that why perhaps those chapters were there but with that why i would have learned much more as uh, a young professional and i think in the hindsight uh, you're talking about life skills conflict management money relationship and uh, and you are absolutely right sex education is just part of that larger gamut of uh, life skills with that uh, toshin i would want to now take the extension and talk about your mckinsey journey i very interestingly have been uh, following uh, vinod kosla who's the celebrated investor and uh, he had this controversial tweet that uh, went viral i'm not sure uh, if you read it but it says something like this that i can't imagine having one life to live and uh, spending it working at mckinsey uh, you have spent a long bit of life but of course you left it i wanted to get your perspectives uh, on this uh, entire thought around working for mckinsey for life or consulting i think i don't think of course only vinod kosla knows why he made a statement i think it's very interesting that you always take a pot shot at the best institution okay so for vinod kosla he could have said oh spend life working for any other random consulting firm he didn't because he knew that only if he makes it against mckinsey does it become uh, you know news worthy and twitter and viral worthy okay so there must be something about mckinsey that's why vinod kosla should take a pot shot at it he didn't take it at uh, some I am Ira Gera consulting firm because then only people would be like, why is Vinod Khosla doing all of it? Okay, so that's point one. I think McKinsey has that allowed status. Number one. Number two is see, there are there will always be a set of people for whom consulting is phenomenal and uh, consulting will uh, is what they can do for life. Okay, it's just that consulting is a great way. to get initiated into the business world because you learn very rapidly about so many topics and with mckinsey i have worked across so many sectors worked across so many countries so to me today the confidence that i have like last week i was in india the week before i was in spain working on uh, something before that i was in france two weeks from now i'm in vienna uh, then uh, in japan so i think my ability to work in almost any country and be very comfortable understand cultural nuances I would credit McKinsey a lot for it because you know it does certain core business principles, certain core people management things are very very common, and I think the confidence that you get uh, is, is spectacular. The problem solving abilities because almost anything can be solved with a problem solving framework. Stakeholder management, okay, amazing skill. You need to understand like today in my role as the global COO, I have investors, I have media, I have. internal plant folks i have my sales and marketing guys i have finance i have uh, you know hr i have uh, it so when you are looking getting anything done uh, is the, the real issue is if you have the right people and you can get them to work together i think anything will be done there is no door but stakeholder management making nothing teaches you uh, it like a consulting thing is what can a cons- consultant cannot mandate a client consultant has to use a combination of soft influencing intellectual um, uh, you know problem solving clarity of communication be able to split the signal from the noise the get the right message across do it in the fewest and possible words and in the most impactful manner which people make it memorable so some those a lot of those skills are you know you definitely learn in mckinsey and in you know any top tier consulting firm because this is not a endorsement i'm making of your bcg i'm mckinsey so it's not a you know which firm is better so i think so there is a element of being able to work in different contexts having that confidence that it doesn't matter if you are working with a german colleagues or with a government in africa or with uh, a public sector institution a multilateral institution in washington uh, you just want to make sure that you have the the confidence in yourself that you can still get work done okay which i think is a very important skill set which only an institution which enables you and gives you all those opportunities that so i think that's what i would say is a phenomenal uh, skill set a bunch of skills i think what mckinsey or any consulting firm does not do and which is probably what vinod khosla was alluding to is at the end of the day the 
key decisions are the clients okay so consultant can tell me whatever there is only so much skill in the game that they have okay it is my decision now on the other side of the table it is my decision you can tell me whatever but it is my business the stakes are very very different okay when it comes to running your own business and there are by the way so that is one aspect which is decision making and skill in the game you will never learn that on powerpoint or excel in terms of uh, when you are you know you can always draw an org chart and say you know this is the new org structure let's but you know you can say by the way, moving one person is going to be so complex that person will have his family his kid school so he can't move until in the middle of the school year if he moves then there will be like some pension you have to make do or here you move somebody into that new geography there will be other complications so just even one box on an organogram or a org chart just getting that has so many more steps which when you are looking at it from a consulting standpoint you will never understand similarly managing media managing governments managing investors it is very very different okay you can always say by the way this is the best way to grow business make an investment let's invest okay looking at an investment is it the right time what is the impact on your debt credit rating agencies will go for a toss in the in this time when you are putting a plant you will have all kinds of local government issues to handle over there it's very easy from a consulting standpoint to say look the plant has to be here and the location and so on so i'm not belittling the either of the skill set i think a combination of both is important you do need a right framework for problem solving right when to do communication i don't think any profession with probably with the exception of legal profession teaches you that clarity of thought in terms of you know uh, how do you effectively command an audience how do you make sure that you are giving the right messages okay which a consulting firm teaches you because you have only so much time with important stakeholders and clients okay. but on the other hand there are very key skill sets on government management media investors people i think even you can always advise clients on what to do in terms of new business but who is the person i have 20 ideas which are absolutely brilliant but i don't have one person who will do it moment i hire from outside it will create problem for that new person because my existing team will get destabilized if i promote an existing person there will be who will do his existing job his current boss will not release him so the operational challenges which are there are a reality okay so i do think that's why and for me it was more i had done consulting for 19 years i mean i can do it in my sleep it's something which i like doing but i didn't want it to be the only chapter of my professional life and that's why to that extent vinod khosla's thing is right i mean unless you have experienced the highs and lows of uh, um, you know both sides uh, it it just makes you a lot more complete as a professional i do have the by the way i'm a great i have great regard for mckinsey bcg bain i work with all three by the way so in my on the other side so because they give me some of the best ideas when i need to get implementation accelerated when i want to cut out the political noise around something i need clear answers so i have a very uh, good way to use consultants to help me what i want to do but there are times when i want my teams to build that confidence i want the teams to develop the capabilities it's not outsourcing of uh, things but the right combination will always be be there and uh, you know as so there will still be people and many colleagues of mine many friends in mckinsey um, and bain bcg who will be lifers and i think there is nothing wrong in that consulting is a great profession but you are never learning you will always be missing out on certain things and to me i didn't want to miss out on those i was like theek hai ye bhi kar liya wo bhi karna hai kuch uh, and uh, that's why i and you know the, the more you be a consultant the bigger it becomes to you know uh, the, the withdrawal symptoms and uh, you know just to you become too lazy and too comfortable so and i just like to challenge myself and do new things uh, work in a different uh, context because that's the only way which keeps me fresh as a as a professional wow it's such a balanced view on both the plus and minuses in fact as someone who first started a management school it was relatively easy because i had some bit of experience from my own schooling and then being at bcg i certainly believe when i started my second school in fact it's uh, named all iit for anyone who was not lucky enough to crack the iit j exam at an age of 18 it was a new thing because i'm not an output of data science or i'm not an output of iit myself and certainly that bcg experience gave me a lot of confidence that this is 
unrelatable problem to me but i can still crack it um, and in the same breath in terms of non relatable experiences i think as an entrepreneur i learned a lot through tinkering which is where i think aeroplanes actually came from uh, in the ex- in the same breath i would now want to talk about why did you leave mckinsey when you were a senior partner to a young consultant mind when i was at bcg i always thought senior partners are the most chillax people they go and play cricket on weekend or they go and play golf so when you were at that stature of your life what were you going through and why did you leave mckinsey at the peak of your career a i think it's always better to retire and not retire retire but leave when people ask you why and not why not okay so that is definitely and i said i was bored i mean the genuine reason is uh you know because you're doing the same thing yeah your client names may change geographies may change but the core of what you do is the same and i just felt that uh, uh you know i still had a have a lot more professional working years ahead of me so let me understand and explore the uh, new stuff and challenge myself i mean consulting as i said i mean i really i love consulting i know i can do it in my sleep but i do want to make sure that i am becoming more rounded i understand now legal issues better i understand taxation better i understand deals a lot better i understand uh, media and uh, reputation management better understand handling of boards better and those skills i would never have learned but i was like you know if my safety net okay if i don't do anything what will i do i will go back to consulting okay if i am but if that is such a high safety net then i owe it to myself to challenge myself and say if i'm missing something kar lena chahiye na matlab usme डाउनसाइड क्या मेरा माई डाउन साइड इज ओनली माई डिस्कम्फर्ट दैट ओ शेट आई एम लिविंग बिहाइंड समथिंग विच आई एम एक्सट्रीमली वेल सेटल्ड इन बट आई थिंक लर्निंग सो आई वॉज नॉट लर्निंग आई वॉज नॉट पुशिंग माई सेल्फ देर इज अ न्यू क्लाइंट ठीक है न्यू इंडस्ट्री ठीक है बट द प्रोसेस ऑफ क्लाइंट डेवलपमेंट द प्रोसेस ऑफ डिलीवरी ऑफ प्रोजेक्ट द इंटरनल थिंग्स आई लेट मल्टीपल प्रैक्टिस आई वॉज ऑन द कमिटी ग्लोबल कमिटी ऑफ मिकिन जी विच इलेक्ट पार्टनर्स सो आई आई so i've done all of it it was not as if for uh, think i haven't got something but i said still something is missing and that something missing was a lot about you know let me just put myself in a different environment and see my gyan to diya hai bahut let's take that uh, own medicine but also uh, as i said to me it was you know at the end of like exactly what vinod khosla said i go through a professional career of 40 years 35 years whatever else it is uh and i don't think any of us is going to retire retire because what is i do want if my body is productive and my mind is engaged what i do it doesn't matter i mean i am never going to go on to the beach and uh, sip martinis because i'll go to the beach i may sip martinis but in 2 3 days what will i do i will still need something to keep uh, yourself engaged because that's the beauty of medical science that's the beauty of the phase at least we know touch wood short of tragic instances and life threatening situations we will have the ability to work well into our 70s if not 80s so i do need to learn new things and uh, discover uh, you know the beauty of other parts of business and i do think uh, today i am able to do that i am able to go deeper into because uh, as a part of my global role i have businesses in latin america i have a business in japan businesses in europe so just the, in mckinsey for example I was always running, so morning meeting set up, go land, go there directly meeting. Pay, go, 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 go I had like rarely out this ki where is the time to go to the toilet oh let me block it before somebody else takes that time the toilet jane ke liye time hona chahiye so it was just activity 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 now i have a lot more free time but my see it's also strain versus stress consulting is a lot about strain you are doing many many things you are preparing come speaking and as you are more senior you have multiple clients multiple teams somebody will always have a problem you have to go and speak because you are a part of a you are a knowledge leader you are a thought leader in certain things so people want you to come and speak at different things so you are doing many activities in the corporate role you have a lot more free time but whatever time you have you have to be very specific in the meetings you have to make sure work gets done because at the end of the day 
unlike a consulting firm when there is a project which is delivered here i need the business to happen i need a deal to happen i need a crisis to be completely solved so mai ek meeting mein solve karu 10 meeting mein solve karu solve hua to i am good solve nahi hua to who am i to justify the monthly numbers will demonstrate how good or bad my decision making and my ability to operate as a manager has been wow that's very courageous of you to leave a very stable and a safe firm when you reached that that point in your career and do something which perhaps brought you at the edge and do something uh, much more interesting uh, you used certain terms uh, such as uh, you talking about taxation now you're working with a legal team as well i have another curiosity to pick your brains on there are rising narratives in india for example about the high tax rates so uh, there are for example people such as ashneet grover who are talking about that there is a flat 28 percentage tax rate in gaming and then there are people who are saying that gaming is as good as gambling as well uh, there are two schools of thought one is tiered taxation which is what is happening in india and then for example there are countries such as georgia flat one tax for all so what are your views uh, on this uh, debate going on on taxation for india yeah i think there is a you know see this is there is a whole thing about direct taxation and indirect taxation okay that's that's point number 1 because indirect taxation is exactly that it's flat whether anybody buys a toothpaste the gst in it or whether we go to a, a salon and uh, it's it's flat right it doesn't matter your income could be billion million 100 the so in a way that flat taxation does exist in the, on the indirect side okay. on the direct side the whole progressive system of taxation does require that if you earn more you should pay more if you earn less you pay less it's a fairness system the, the why is it becoming more and more relevant today the debate this debate work could have been there but india people forget on the direct side you know 50 60 70 years back i don't know if that india had 90% personal income tax okay that's why nobody wanted to start businesses because you are better off uh, being in government and everything taken care of you are better off uh, a public sector employment was exactly that and we stifled so many businesses so we've come down from a 92% taxation regime to whatever it is today okay the challenge becomes that how many people really pay the taxes and over time because of digital india because of you know all electronification of records because of the way the government has tried to plug every loophole tumne itna kharcha kar diya matlab tumhare paas itna paisa hoga tumne ye kar liya matlab paisa hoga so we are almost assuming you have the wealth but you are not paying those taxes so there is a whole issue of jinke paas paisa hai wo tax kitna de rahe on the direct side because if they are not then there is always a question of what um, you know ashneer go or anybody else uh, says is just because i am doing my business in the cleanest possible manner with the records you are taxing me but somebody else is not doing it so that uh, black economy continues so that is a fair argument there in terms of compliance But I don't think you can achieve that one shot. Okay, over time because of GST, the tax net has been increased. The number of taxpayers are increasing, and so on. So I think that's a gradual process. Okay, any large country you cannot have one flat rate of income tax. It's just not going to work for uh, you know 30 percent because for somebody whose income is one lakh rupees, you say 30 percent is tax. Then 70,000 में वो क्या क्या कर पाएगा is a question. 10 lakh में 30 percent या I you know one million by thirty percent absolutely, but the, as you go lower, that's where the complication starts happening. Is the remainder of that income, and it's not as if by the way the remainder of that income is not taxed. That gets taxed on the expenditure side with, through GST and other stuff. So the tax to wahan par bhi hai. Okay. I think the complication happens when the people start saying this because of taxation, the country is not conducive for doing business. Okay. So you seeing some of the venture capital and pe firm partners relocating to singapore dubai and saying oh by the way i'll have a high tax is there a choice at end of the day capital and talent are always going to be globally mobile and countries will have to figure out their own strategy so singapore earlier had zero taxation now singapore when they don't want more people to come has obviously increased its taxation in a, a certain manner there will always be countries which will give you zero tax like dubai but there are other trade offs you will have to make in terms of life choices and uh, you know where do you want to stay in a city uh, state which is exactly plasticky in, in that sense so these are personal choices there will never be a perfect solution to it 
gaming is it gambling versus skill who knows i mean i said to me there are enough and more uh, precedent and the question becomes what is the driving motive behind the taxation is it to encourage or is it to discourage certain taxes are to discourage so when you put higher and higher taxes on cigarettes okay hey, despite all the things you want people to smoke less whether it's effective or not only itc's balance sheet and pnl can uh, say i haven't studied that itc keep generating cash irrespective of taxes and alcohol and so on so on the income tax side i think uh, you will always have a progressive thing the question becomes compliance which i think will increase there is a separate debate which you didn't mention chatakshi which is saying i pay so much tax but what do i get in return sadke to waisi hai ये तो है दैट ऑल्सो इज चेंजिंग इंडिया इज इम्प्रूविंग इट्स इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इंडिया इज इम्प्रूविंग द क्वालिटी ऑफ सम ऑफ दिस थिंग बट इट्स अगेन ग्रेजुअल थिंग इफ आई एम इन सिटी विच हैज बैड रोड और द नाला हैज जस्ट ओपन अप आई विल ऑलवेज कंप्लेन वेर एज इफ आई एम ऑन द समृद्धि महामार्ग वेर इट्स अ ब्रिलियंट थिंग एंड द होल नागपुर मुंबई जर्नी विच इज टू टेक एक्स आज नॉट एक्स वाई आई थिंक इट्स अ डिफरेंट चॉइस आई मीन आर एयरपोर्ट्स आर इम्प्रूविंग आर लॉट ऑफ द फेसिलिटीज Uh, are improving so i would say it's a we are this is a part of a journey of moving from being a developing nation to a or a emerging nation to a middle income nation we may not still never get to the thing uh, the, the upper end but i think it's a gradual process many countries have gone through it to a level where countries like us they may be fair but you always have delaware corporations you have trust structures where uh, you know you want to do tax planning from some people call it tax planning some may call it tax optimization some may call it tax avoidance these are all shades of gray so i won't get into that but the the whole thing is countries define tax policies based on certain objectives okay you may export processing zones you are saying it's a free trade area free trade zone you want to drive exports that's how we created all these it parks and uh, infosys wipro created this mega services business because you wanted to drive that you want right now through gst through uh, digital payments through the all records so you see the income tax filing today is so simple because they always say that ye already tax portal bata raha hai aapka hai ye tax deducted at source hai ab aapko return file karna it's we are moving to singapore where every year in singapore the government tells you this is your tax due if you have a dispute tell us or by this date please pay so citizen doesn't have to do anything on that but that implies a certain amount of electronification of records all transactions and that's happening okay thanks to the government's effort that's happening this will always affect people who have either who can do tax planning and now i'm not able to do it or because of which i'm saying yaar main agar us desh mein rehta to main mujhe tax nahi bharna padta to ja i mean you can't like you can't stop people no In any case even if you had you you can't stop but tumko india mein business karna hai to follow the norms you can always lobby see the whole issue is even and as warren buffet said that warren buffet pays lesser tax than his receptionist because he has enough of trust structures he has enough of uh, um, you know uh, legally defined means to actually save because he is not getting salary he is getting capital gains capital gains are taxed at lesser than salary and he never sells so <laughs> there is a dividends are not taxed so you can always you know within the tax structure of a country now warren buffet can somebody say Oh, Warren Buffet, because he's so rich, should pay more tax. He's just whatever is the law, he's abiding by it, and his secretary is not able to abide by it. Whose fault is it? It's not anybody's fault that his income constitution is in a certain way uh, in line with uh, tax laws. So, to me, that's the whole debate. I think we are just seeing that certain people are getting pained more because you are seeing some startups exit. So, founders make suddenly money, and you're saying that. ये सब मैं अगर मैं सिंगापुर में होता तो मुझे टैक्स नहीं भरना पड़ता अगर मैं तो नहीं हो ना अभी अभी तो नहीं हो होते तो ठीक है मतलब अभी क्या कर सकते हैं बिकॉज वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ टैक्सेशन एंड यू आर इन द सेम ब्रेथ वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट your flexibility and your freedom to move out of india and then there are newspaper articles which are talking about high net worth individuals which are moving out of india as well and in the same breath there are talks about the weakness of the indian passport uh, you are in london right now i'm not sure if you are london citizen uk citizen or indian citizen but what do you think is indian. your my passport is indian <laughs> so passport is indian so what do you think of the indian passport being weak what do you think should people have national pride and stay in india or should they rather prefer to move abroad 
where they may be better treated maybe perhaps so what are your views on it see i think there are two different uh, they may be related but i think in my view there are two separate points there first is the indian passport where do you need passports most importantly you need it for travel and if the, every country uh, you know if you have an indian passport you need a visa and for a visa you need to give your passport which goes for x day so i have to go to japan uh, in two weeks i have given my passport now it will take whatever it takes but before that i also need to go to portugal and vienna so if i have to go there i am like now praying whether i get my passport back from the japanese consulate in time i have a schengen but i don't have my japanese visa so the complication becomes that if you in certain roles okay like where i have to travel extensively i do feel constrained that you know my passport goes and i'm not able to uh, travel and it's also complicated by the fact that india does not allow dual citizenship there are many countries where you, who face their passport is individually weak but if they allow dual citizenship so i have given one passport for a visa i am always able to travel on another passport which i have not and people optimize saying ki dono weak passports hai but ek time pe maine ek visa ke liye diya main dusre pe travel karta hu so india has complicated that factor by saying you don't even have dual citizenship so if you have to travel extensively then you will always have to plan it a lot better so some of my colleagues who are us citizens or who are uh, european citizens they don't bother about things like oh visa to mera travel and i'm like oh i have to be there in this canada but getting a canadian visa is like a pain it's like i have to give my passport for 3 to 4 weeks and then i'm praying so that means i will not be able to travel so it does affect my day to day work okay so to me in that context that's a massive weakness number one but separately pride has nothing to do with uh, the passport and so on because if i if india were to allow dual citizenship many folks would just take it because who wants to renounce the citizenship voluntarily no, it's not nobody wants to do it so i do think pride is, and by the way pride is not just uh, evident from a passport okay it's also about who you are i mean people who change their accent the moment they leave india i mean you've spoken and you suddenly don't need to put up a british accent or a american accent and roll your r's it just doesn't it's not required people change that opportunities so you know for so many years you've been speaking in a certain manner so it doesn't so there are i can go on and on but uh, and there are many people who by the way have us citizenship but every day they read what is there in indian politics they don't know who their local governor is they are never but they are like india mein in their uh, Sangli, Salap, Solapur, Satara. What's happening? Because they've not adjusted to the new place. They are still Indian. Just having a different citizenship does not change some of those facts. You ask them the last time who is the when was the last non-Indian who you invited home for dinner? They'll be like, ah, uh, koi nahi, koi nahi. So you don't have non-Indian friends. So you just move your professional context differently. But you are living. in the same india so you can move out of india but you can india will never move out of you okay so it's a very different uh, thing you will have so many people who will work in the middle east but they are always saying are me to paise india bhej raha hu meri family india mein so i think we have to separate the fact that you know for work reasons people have to do certain things uh, very few will do uh, give it give up a, a citizenship uh, for, out of missing uh, by the way there is another angle Uh, you know many countries you have e gates where you don't need to stand in the queue for uh, you know anything you just put your passport you scan and sometimes i have to have student queues for 2 hours 3 hours because uh, thing and you know people are just going walking bus that's when you say are agar koi dusra passport hota sma hum bhi smart gate use karte so to me the weakness is only in the context of efficiency and time there is nothing else I and mean, i'm very proud to have my see i will never change my accent and I don't care about uh, these things, but do I feel inconvenienced? Absolutely, I do. But I'm saying, don't need to change it. I don't need. If, if India gave a dual citizenship option, of of course I would take it because then I can get, take any passport without giving up. You're making me choose, saying it's either us or nothing. That's the complication, and I would never do it willingly unless, like, you have. If by the way, there's a second thing. If India is able to do reciprocative passport arrangements with so many countries, do it. तो करो ना कि नहीं चाहिए बट कैनेडियंस को इंडिया के लिए वाई आर ऑल ऑफ दिस डन बिकॉज इट्स रेसिप्रोकेटिव इंडिया इंसिस्ट तो अदर कंट्री विल इंसिस्ट तो मत करो इंसिस्ट यार सो दैट्स द 
टू मी दोज आर द रियल इन माय माइंड द रियल इश्यूज द नॅशनॅलिटी अँड प्राईड इज अ लॉट डीपर माय कल्चर बाय फिलिंग्स a lot deeper now the good news for me is i i'm in india every 5 to 6 weeks so i'm like i don't miss india or anything i'm always there and i spend uh, you know enough time in india uh, for my business and for personal uh, stuff and so on so i never feel removed uh, from india okay so uh, to that extent there is no separation but there are many people who come to india once a year and they have that oci card i think oci card is great because it almost allows you to do everything other than vote okay but it doesn't they have given up their citizenship they are overseas they have a nationality which is different that's why they have an oci card it's it's close the india is oci is a close thing to a dual citizenship but if you move one step ahead and say why oci just have the indian passport no then you would never be in this dilemma i completely concur and I've had similar experiences with respect to what you're saying. Of course, I don't travel as extensively where my passport is stuck at one place or another. But there is another pa- parallel that at least has come to my mind. There is caste system in India, and I feel there is caste system at the international borders as well. Where just because I have an Indian passport, I'm not able to move through that speed gate uh, that you are talking about. With that, at uh, Tushan, I would want to pivot and now finally talk about work-life balance and your personal life, which are another things that I wanted your views on. and i've seen your really great amazing photographs uh, with your trekking uh, experiences so what do you do to have a work life balance today as a coo and what were certain things that you were doing to have a work life balance while you were at mckinsey i think i mean to me work life balance is a in some ways a misnomer because it's never about time i've always believed that time is a you know who says you cannot work on a sunday Okay. who says i mean it's just a convention and it was you know if you look at it, sunday is a holiday saturday is a holiday uh, what is a holiday it's a in a in a gregorian calendar system holiday was nothing but a holy day so it was meant to be that the one day of the week you know the farmer the serfs and so on just go to the church and pray and so on so in christianity or in uh, in a jewish religion you had sabbath and so on so it was meant to be that one day where you are focused on god and focused on religion and so on so it was that's how the concept came and that you said that's why there should be no work and we've extended that even in the modern uh, context where i don't think that is as and i have never believed uh, that uh, somebody else is telling me that you no know, i may not insist you work on us if you're my work counterpart no you should not but i can always work whenever i want to and who's you know it's just and i have always believed in the fluidity if work requires work If, who says ki wednesday i cannot take off or i am just uh, lounging around nobody if my work is done my i don't care and, uh, and i was doing this even pre covid work from home was my long lasting uh, thing that you know if i like to work from somewhere i'll work from uh, this and staycations and uh, workations and so on so these these nomenclatures were always there with me because i never believed work had a time and then see it's almost when you say work life no so actually the challenge is you're saying work is not a part of life i'm dividing there is work and then there is a the rest of life no it's not work is not what happens on weekdays and life is not what ha- happens on weekends okay it's a artificial notion which we have created for convenience uh, sake so to me the crux becomes energies and priorities okay to me all of us have four energy cylinders there is first is your physical energy okay how active you are and that's a function of you know your uh, sleep your diet your exercise uh, your rigor your passion for doing stuff and so on you know, how active so your physical cylinder okay so energies you work you exhaust it through lack of sleep you're working your physical battery will be down okay your eyes will start showing you will get disease you will have all of it second is your intellectual cylinders it comes from problem solving really doing the stuff that you like to do in in the work context in professional context you exercise that too much you are going to be burn out exhausted fatigue because your mind is fatigued you're sitting in the same desk just too much work 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 but if you are on too many vacations and you're not exercising that cylinder that energy is just like are kya ho raha hai i'm bored okay so that's your second cylinder of energy the third cylinder is the social cylinder which are family friends your hobbies i mean uh, hobbies which have more interactive uh, element in that sense so you need to if that cylinder that energy is not being channelized you always say you are not having time for family 
and your last one is your for lack of a better thing it's your personal spiritual whatever you may want to call it but it's your what do you do for yourself and so to me it's always been about balancing these four if i'm ex- spending too much on work then i know okay my and i'm starting to feel exhausted i know because my other energies i haven't used and this energy i have exhausted myself on this too much so i need to shift and i and do it and then i need to shift back and do something else so that was one critical aspect of it and to me the second one was priorities because un- like in work you always say i need to get x done and you do it in other aspects also if i don't at least the way i work if i don't put it as a explicit goal it will never happen so if i don't say i need to so if i put a goal as i want to climb say a certain mount peak so i'm doing say amadablam uh, in nepal in november so unless i put it then i know i need to train for it so then everything else uh, is systematic around it so am i uh, running will be systematic my strength and conditioning will be systematic my stretching will happen if i'm in general then it is very easy for that to slip because there is no priority i know in the mountain i'm going to suffer unless so it is better to you know suffer at sea level to smile at the summit so that's my this thing so i know there is no option that i have so and by the way the so trekking mountaineering climbing it's very meditative for me okay and i used to do and in mckinsey also i've done a lot of corporate boxing i've done a lot of martial arts uh, so because it just kept me uh, to use a lot of my physical energies and it's it from a health standpoint from a it's extremely meditative boxing is so meditative because if you don't focus you're going to get hit and that pain is going to be like really bad so uh, you you just so into the moment so to me mindfulness is also something which i learned from boxing more than from uh, any other uh, meditative form because wahan pe kuch bhi boxing mein nahi hua to fatka baithega and that pain is going to <laughs> pain makes me uh, you know the, the fear of pain makes me meditative but to me i just also feel that you have only one life so do everything that you want to so uh, now when i'm going to a certain place i will make sure that of course i will do work but i will then make sure it's the local cuisine the local art form the local museum i'll go into the run in and see the city uh, in today so because i'm not there only for work yeah work is the main reason but i need to understand that city i need to and it's such a pleasure and that's why i feel very lucky whether it was at mckinsey or my in upl and my current role because i have the flexibility to go to different places explore them and uh, it just it is very fascinating when you become more of a you know you read different things you interact with different people and you understand why football is so phenomenal in spain and argentina so i was in argentina during the world cup uh, thing and i was like just seeing Uh, what they do and people people change their marriages based on the football dates people had sold their houses to go to the world cup uh, because that ticket was so expensive you just think oh, why is that country so mad i mean you understand cultures only when you are there you understand the music so i just feel that if uh, it makes me get experience see beyond a point at least my it's not a work life balance question but if you have the opportunity to do these things and you are working i think you should take use of all of it so then work and life are not too separate it's all intermingled so am i did i have a great time of course it was not just for the work but i've connected with the people i have had the best so now i know i can tell you the best local alcohol the best local food items the best local music now otherwise what's the point i certainly agree to the fact that culture music their books can actually make you extremely humble in fact uh, martin rees who is currently the bcg henderson institute chairman he said that i live a very privileged life because i read a lot in my free time and in my work time i just get to read and i just get to learn so i realized uh, what kind of privilege you are talking about just to be clear i think many people may not have the privilege to enjoy their work and when they don't enjoy their work perhaps that's when they crave for life being separate and work being separate for example there's this unfortunate video of this girl from byju's which has gone out taking rounds on internet she is complaining about her variable not coming etc of course i think it is not good for her as well that she is being shot but then i was thinking that there is certain class of people who do not maybe enjoy their work i think to me the you know from a work context i think you need to either Uh, have impact so you are progressing you are doing good things or you need to have fun 
you're enjoying really what you're doing you may not be having impact you do same thing again and again but you are having fun you are with a great set of colleagues you're solving some interesting problems like people should do at google or people do in you know whatever or you are learning you are learning certain very important skill sets now if you are doing all three you will always be in the zone you will say this is the best place and i am deriving immense joy but i don't think of work life balance the complication happens see if you are doing two of three still okay one of three maybe if you are doing none of three and you don't see a future then i think it's time to start thinking of changing the job also or doing something else but i do think work life balance comes in the context of saying am i burnt out at work okay and somebody just uh, you know when uh, one of my mentors was asked this question of work life balance and he said yeah you can have work life balance but ask yourself what is life okay what is the quality of life you are having uh, and somebody said oh i'm passionate about dance is it what was the when was the last time you danced 11 years back so you're not passionate about it you just think you have some notion that at some stage in life you're passionate if you're passionate you should have done it in the last two weeks nobody can say that passionate about something if they have done it zero times in the last two weeks that was his good benchmark he was like you know what's stopping you from it that means you don't think of it as a priority okay and you can do that or see if, if you have a you know in somebody was just uh, again another mentor of mine had a great uh, uh, this thing on fitness he said if you don't find time for health okay, you will find time for sickness time to utna hi jayega you don't find time for your health you will find time for sickness so sickness kar le karna hai to health ke liye karo sickness mein ek time pe bahut kya hoga fitness ke liye har din itna jata hai ya har alternate itna jayega time to jana hi wala hai whether you want it or not that's not in your control so it is better to find time for health so i do think for young professionals if they fix a few things no i think there's just a few things like i will exercise in a few thing or i will have one hobby it's not too much to ask for i mean no job in the world even that of elon musk uh very as three companies to manage and so on is going to be so stressful that you cannot exercise for some time you cannot have a hobby or meet friends or do one thing for yourself that could be listening to music it could be journal it could be doing just three things something for your health something for your social personal stuff uh, passion and something just for your peace if you can do these three things then you will eventually each one figures out work life balance work life balance is it a sequential thing or a parallel thing like for me it's always parallel some people say it's sequential you know i work hard for x months and then i'm taking a week off or some people say every four weeks i take thursday friday saturday sunday off so you can think about your own approaches to work life balance but you need to have a approach to uh, that otherwise you will by the way it's very critical because you will never be effective at work if you are always burnt out if you don't have energy if you are one part of your mind is always focused on that friend whom you haven't met but who's going through a tough time and you are feeling guilty about it you will never be effective i think for being effective you need to have balance of your life so i would say it's a life balance i just find the term work life balance to be because it is almost castigating work out now if you see it's by the way I mean, you would have done it. I have done it. In the initial days at McKinsey, I was in office all seven days. Okay, I just wanted to blow it out of the park. I was not just doing one client project. I was doing many other things. But that was my choice. And over time, I then tried to figure. You know, weave things around it. You get more mature. You then you know it's an early stage in your career and life. You don't have family responsibilities. In, as you start, you you will learn. Everybody learns their own balance. so it is not and by the way, even today if there is a critical thing you have to work 24 hours i'm not going to complain because there will be times when i'll work zero hours so to me the priority has to dictate the time it can't be uh, you know we are not in that age where you know today where somebody was saying me telling one of my relatives saying uh, i had just taken her to my office she's like oh but do you where is the punch card system because she worked 40 years in a public sector bank where they had a punch card system of entry and exit today the work is all here work is happening on zoom call so just because physically i am tapping a card does that mean my work starts when i tap a card will my work end when i tap a card out no it's just not possible a lot of my work is on calls a lot of my work is to when i'm meeting people for coffee that is work now you can say oh you are in a great coffee shop of course i am in a great coffee shop why should we not be in a great coffee shop but we are still 
working we are looking to hire somebody i'm interviewing somebody i'm having a difficult conversation with somebody who's not performing but it's is it now if i do that discussion over a great set of drinks uh, is that work or am i enjoying wine how do you differentiate see some of these concepts were concepts of a earlier era where you always said you know my my uh, in-laws my, when my father in law would come home he would there is no work he'll say ke monday to friday ke baad monday ko after office jane ke baad till then he had nothing to think about and as an entrepreneur you know entrepreneurs can never switch off it's your business who will you say nahi abhi main available nahi hu nahi you are always available that's the tough part of entrepreneurship yes like you said few days i'm working 16 hours few days it's zero right and i really loved your saying on you spend your time on health today in a positive manner otherwise you spend it on sickness i think there is a famous uh, confucius philosopher who said that a healthy man wants 100 things and an unhealthy man just wants one and on that note uh, perhaps i'm almost at the second last question that i had planned for you bill gates come up with his book recommendations for summers i came across this very mind blowing post of yours where you are saying that you have read 250 books plus 50 books this year so what will be your 10 book recommendations for young professionals i'm already now at 311 <laughs> i am behind the count <laughs> no 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 i didn't put anything on insta or on linkedin so no i think getting to see it's very different for um, what should i say because i read this random stuff if somebody recommends i just i just read it so i so i'm going to just read randomly i, I may not it may not be the most uh top uh, 10 or something so i think there is a uh, very recently i read a book called do you think you are clever um it's from oxford and cambridge um, uh questions and it asks very fundamental questions which we we never think about okay so it's a you just it's more common sense but you, you never ask yourself as to why oh shit why is this even relevant that was a very good one i think um Alone on the Wall. It's a book by. Uh, it's a biography of Alex Honnold, who's one of the greatest solo climbers in the world. And uh, uh, Alex Honnold is always asked these questions about because he climbs the, the this thing is, and I'm also a climber. Uh, of course, I'm I'm not sure hardcore amateur compared to what Alex does, but uh, you know I, we we always climb with all the ropes and so on. And Alex Honnold's claim to fame is he does it free solo, which is there's no ropes. and he's asked saying uh, by a school kid 12 year old kid saying but aren't you afraid you will die and his response is phenomenal he said so will you so i am just making sure i go out with a bang so it's a very and then he of course he goes on to explain it but uh, alone on the wall is a is a great uh, book i think uh, i also liked um, um, shivaji the great maratha it's a autobiography of shivaji by ranjit desai it's a iconic amazing book I think Naval Ravikant's Almanac is again a phenomenal one. I think uh, he's crystallized lots of business and life uh, lessons. Um, I like. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at uh, Unshackle Your Potential by David Goggins. I think uh, David Goggins, although it's more on the physical dimension, I think uh, Goggins is a is an icon of just going through pain. But on business, I like Dilbert gives you business. Scott Adams is probably the greatest business thinker ever, uh, and all the stuff that he puts on Dilbert is extremely, extremely relevant. Uh, I think "Brief Answers to Big Questions" by Stephen Hawking, another iconic book, amazing iconic book. Um, the last two uh, i'm just thinking skin in the game by nicolas nassen talep i think it just is a lot of psychology on how do you structure organization and incentives how do you think of social contracts business contracts 12 rules of life by jordan peterson i mean jordan peterson is probably in today's day and age one of the most original and controversial thinkers very few people think as originally as as him i think bad blood it's uh, elizabeth holmes uh, theranos scandal it tells you 
how you can take the world for a ride for a long long time life span another great book and maybe the last one since we started on india i think um, 10 judgments that changed india by um, uh, the zia modi i think it talks we will talk of the india today i think she's just done a the uh, supreme court judgments do create or uh, legal jurisprudence does create a way of how the country is shaped when we spoke of taxation and so on i think what she she looked at 10 iconic judgments that have changed india since 1947 it's again a, it's slightly more legal uh, in that sense but it is uh, you know it's another you know phenomenal one and then there are several 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 books i think on the fiction side because i do read fiction also i just think it should not just be uh, you know serious stuff uh, i think just merge uh, and sometimes you listen so audible plus reading so i mix it between audible and reading um, and also blinkist because if i don't have the time and like the book doesn't seem good but you know blinkist just gives that in 15 so i've just figured now how to do it but i don't count the books i do on blinkist as a part of the list because that's cheating so uh, but yeah so that's my i can Imagine how long the list would be if we start counting the blinkest one. With that, we are almost at the end of this CEO pod with you, Toshin. I have one last question. Anyone who must have seen this pod till this stage would have been blown by your knowledge, would have been wowed by your credentials, would have certainly wanted to walk in your shoes as well. As someone who has been a McKinsey partner who is now going places, have you ever faced failure? If yes, what was it? and if there is any how did you cope up with it i think failure is given i think uh, one cannot uh, see if you don't fail enough that means you're not trying enough because you know you will only succeed if you know if you have 100% success record that means you are just in that comfort zone so you only do things which you are very comfortable with so you always now the only issue with failure becomes is it a catastrophe is it a error is it a fopa is it a mistake so there is a whole spectrum now catastrophes are ones where you cannot recover from it in a very very long time okay um, i don't think i now done uh, got into that catastrophic level of uh, things but mistakes happen i think i have made mistakes in making investments uh, in my in my startups context i have made had mistakes in trusting people then you suddenly say hey, but by the guy turned around completely and uh, you are wondering as to uh, why things happened uh, there have been failures when you've tried to launch certain things or work in in a consulting context work with clients and then suddenly nothing has worked out and you know you just felt saying but the so for example there was a case where you know because we felt things were going well we said okay let's accelerate how we are doing the transformation and so we moved fast and then the project failed later uh, and the ceo was like you are responsible for it and you know mckinsey did not advise and so on and they like but you know at that time we jointly agreed that you know because the initial pilots were going well there was a certain rollout plan uh, and uh, the intent was to fast track it so that the company would get the best benefit uh, and in hindsight i realized that um, you know I, i just could have managed had i just continued uh, thing and i was quite naive about uh, understanding about who's being set up for failure and so on so you do get that kind of failure sometimes there is a failure when you look at things and say okay one year from now also things haven't moved one year back you had said agreed and you are like shit you have wasted an year uh, and uh, why did we fail so very recently there was a certain uh, business where we wanted to turn it around much faster we couldn't do that for a long time and i realized that the main reason for that failure was i was being too soft i was worried about if i'm too tough what will happen you know somebody will leave of uh, the external there will be context of oh have we failed in this what will it mean for me personally so i was too worried about many other factors and hence i was hoping that certain people would take get the message certain people would change on their own uh, by being soft i thought i was able to uh, maintain respect and dignity kind of thing till a point when it became such a to just all uh, you know no rules uh, thing just be tough clean it up and and get it done so i think the failure was not in the action the failure was that the action was taken at least one year later if not uh, earlier and it was a lot the reason behind that failure was what will x think the uh, wanting to preserve the image of being in a certain 
context as opposed to really saying what does the situation need so that was that was another thing and i think is that nobody uh, you know you let a situation continue for longer than what you should have i think to me that becomes a, a failure i think there was another sometimes a failure happens not in a context but when you merge things and you're saying okay on the the whole life balance situation where sometimes you have to take a call and you are like when a family needs you for certain things and you are like oh shit i that call may have been taken wrong because the failure is only in action or inaction both sometimes your inaction creates the failure you didn't act when you should have and sometimes your action creates the failure i think failures of action i think i have been able to course correct much faster okay because you can always you know it you'll say i'm sorry let's put it a plan in place and and get it done failures of inaction are very difficult because the more inaction continues it becomes difficult to backtrack and the big learning from failure which at least i have had is you know now i ask myself the question will this matter 10 years from now because if it is going to matter 10 years from now then i better better learn and correct from it if it is not going to matter it's okay let's just do whatever is required let's do what is right and apologize and get done with it i think the more honest you are with apologies and uh, so long as you don't repeat the same mistake i think failure is has been okay for me i touch wood many cases uh, i've been able to course correct on it uh, but i do think uh, have the failures of inaction even now i would be like shit you know that stuff has but you are hoping somebody else will take it you are hoping the person will suddenly have a uh, transformation and do the right thing but it won't happen and the more i delay the more i am actually failing and uh, that's the big learning at uh, failures of inaction are a lot more difficult to correct and uh, if it is not going to matter 10 years from now it's okay you can always you will get a second chance wow i'm sure this will be extremely helpful for anyone who is in his or her early 20s preparing for career preparing for life uh, with respect to what will an inaction lead them towards so with that we are almost at the wrap up of the ceo diary pod uh, toshan it's been extremely inspirational i have also found my list of books that i am going to hog in the next couple of weeks uh, happy to hear from you if you might have any last words or comments for the young professionals who are going to look up to you and want to advance their career and their life one one piece of counsel suggestion because calling it advice is making it quite high saluting uh sudakshi is see young professionals who haven't seen obviously they're young right they haven't seen a journey i think there is huge value in building skills and building relationships i think i do find today's um uh, youngsters professionals are more concerned about changing jobs for a 20% increment changing jobs for designations saying abhi experience ho gaya mai change kar raha hu or doing what is the culturally right thing to do okay because there is no consequence of downside like theek hai naya job mil jayega kuch naya aur kar lenge but you change too often you don't build the right relationships don't build the right skills i think somebody is in the 20s can continue in that same way till their mid 30s okay but suddenly you come to your mid 30s no you will realize what have you built okay what have you really built why should somebody trust you with a important thing do you know those people are you the best in something so i just think that if they are cuz i do find the decision making process to be a lot fickle thing i don't like my boss i don't like this i don't like that now of course in a ups, when the economy is going well everybody is like you know shifting i have a head hunters calling me left right center and i'm shifting i see people join and move out in 3 months and move out in 6 months you like what, what are you trying to do you can, because see it's unfortunate that you know every 3 years in the fourth year you will earn in more money than what you have earned for all the years before that every 4 years that's a clear thing because you will always step up so the that increment of 30% percent, percent, doesn't matter i think but if you get the if you invest in relationships people know you people trust you they will make you successful you will need those mentors so i just my advice would be invest in and it takes time to build those skills to build those relationships give time for that don't get swayed by uh, short term trends or xyz is this thing so i because i just feel uh, you know and you see in you know generation before people were like oh job hai to matlab sab kuch hai i don't want to leave 
that's also bad because then you are taking shit you are being subservient okay and you are not exploring that's also not the intent you know for somebody who stayed at 19 years at mckinsey it was at a point in time you are not like i have to do this i like doing it be at a place because you are enjoying having fun having impact don't be forced by and now but if you are there in whichever place build those skills build the relationships your reputation in the longer term matters a lot more if you destroy your reputation it is a finish as a professional people need to two reference calls on you what do they say what do people say are you the person do you know your stuff can you be trusted so only two things how do you build those because you know in your 20s whatever 20 to 30 apne kitna bhi kamaya hoga na i can tell you a third age 35 ek saal mein aap utna pura kama lo pura kama loge isme koi question nahi hai that's how you know the power of compounding compounding of careers compounding of money compounding of relationships works unfortunately if you are on this side of the compounding cycle you always feel that oh that new job that new thing new shiny object but swayed and i think the temptation of you know because i have everything available aaj ye nahi to kar aur sahi i don't have make in dusre city chala jaunga par so wahan chala jaunga you develop the reputation of somebody who is just rolling on not building something not focused it will not hit you in your 20s cuz 20s tak to anybody can take you you will get it 30s may when you have to get into positions of leadership that's when some of these matters because you have to be trusted to run large businesses you have to be trusted to manage 100 people 1000 people the problem aega ki is this person the right person that's my only advice don't take whatever decision you take think about it short term but think about longer term if somebody looks at your resume somebody makes reference calls on you what will this decision be viewed as from that point if it is still the right one then take it so yeah i've been long for a very sharp question you asked um, but i have enjoyed myself shitakshi um, and uh, hope people listen to it and uh, if any if it inspires them or makes them think uh, because you know i said i don't claim to you know somebody who's been a career consultant and then now in corporate may not always have the, all the answers because today's job context is also very different careers are very different but um, i do think some of these principles uh, are uh, time tested uh, relationships and skills are the only two things that will matter in the long term thank you so much toshan i'm so glad that you talked about relationships along with skills here's to having sustainable relationships and sustainable skills for life Thank you so much once again for taking our time.